Thank you for coming back to my channel. I'm Gary with Constricted and Addicted. This is Everything Reptile, where I invite somebody in. We get to know a little bit more about them, uh, give them an interview, and, uh, and see who they are. So today's guest is Kelsey from Kelsey's Constrictors. How are you doing? Uh, my first question is going to be like, like, how did you get into owning reptiles? So <clears throat> I... I've always been fascinated with animals. I've always been an animal lover, just in general. Uh, my first reptile that I ever held, this is actually kind of a funny story. So I live in Jacksonville now. I moved back here like a year and a half ago. My first reptile that I ever held was a ball python at the St. Augustine alligator farm. I was 18 and it scared the crap out of me. I remember his tail like curled around and touched my hand and I jumped so hard and there's even a picture of it, it's so funny. But um, after that, I, I really liked reptiles. I didn't really have it in my head that I wanted to own them or anything. I got my first snake, which was a ball python, uh, probably five years ago. And I had him for a little while and then I had a little sand boa so those were my first two reptiles. And after that, I didn't really have any plans to get any more snakes or anything. And then I started thinking this year, like I wanna start a YouTube channel. Cause then I had my dog, I had my bird, I had my snake, uh, and then I had two snakes. I ended up having to get rid of the sand boa at some point, but then I had her, so I still had two snakes. So I'm like, I wanna do something with a YouTube channel. I wanna create a YouTube channel. I wanna do something with animals, but I had no idea what direction I wanted to go with it. So I said, I'm gonna start with Instagram. I'm gonna find out what people like, and then I can direct my YouTube channel towards what people are looking for. And then I found this entire reptile community on Instagram. And I was like, oh my gosh, this exists. This is literally it, the coolest. It's amazing, world. isn't it? Yeah, so that was what really kicked it off. Yeah, I gotta tell you, and it sounds to me like it was a life-changing experience holding that first snake. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I got to share this story with you. It's kind of similar. I, I take my Dumeril's boa pretty much in the summertime. I take them everywhere. I take them to Lowe's. I take them to uh, Walmart and I'll hang out in the parking lot. And I had this one instance where there were these two girls there and they saw the snake and you could see them. They're like looking, but they don't want to say nothing. They kept looking. Yeah. And, and so I approach, I say, would you like to touch him? And I always, you know, present the tail first because that is usually the least threatening feature of a snake yeah. <laughs> and uh and she was like this <laughs> and and her little her little friend was encouraging it like do it do it do it you know in the end the girl that was shaking was the one that was holding max and the girl that was egging her on wouldn't touch her you know or touch, touch max and and i just i when i heard your story that kind of reminded me of that because they, it is Whenever uh, I get to go into schools, uh, not lately, but um, I get to, when I go into schools or I do county fairs or things like that, I get to see the expression, whether it's a child or an adult, when they hold a snake for the first time and they realize that it's not slimy, uh, it's, it doesn't like reach out and try to bite them immediately. And, and it really can change the perspective of somebody and, and not maybe owning a reptile, but maybe just the, the nature of the reptile itself in general. Yeah, I love that you do that because I do the same thing. I'm really, really big on education. I cannot get this to sit still. I don't know what's going on. Um, I'm really big on education and educating people because the, it is, it's the fear of the unknown and you don't know what you don't know. I take my snakes a lot of places. In fact, I just took her to Walmart tonight and I have some people, they look at me and they go, oh my God, what is that? Look, she's got a snake. And then I have other people come up to me and they're like, wow, can I touch it? And I just love the interaction that it, it brings with people. I mean, I've met so many people doing that and I love helping people conquer their fears. You know, they, like you said, they're all shaky and they're like, does it bite? Can, can I touch it? And I'm like, yeah, you can touch her. She doesn't bite. And then they're like, do their hand like that I think it's so funny I've got a friend of mine her son has held Max and Coconut my my call albino and uh ever since he held Coconut he tells his mom every day I want to get a snake mom and she comes she works in my office and she comes in she says you know my son is always telling me Gary I want a snake mom <laughs> <laughs> I love it I love it um I you know what I didn't even know you had a YouTube channel so really? I was 
I checked it out. I, I, you know, it's like, I, I started following you on Instagram and I think that's when it was Kelsey's corner friends. Yep. And I know you had a little debacle with Instagram, but I'm going to also assume that Kelsey's corner friends was a little bit different. Cause I think you were doing your dog. You have a parrot too, right? Yep. yep. It wasn't just geared towards snakes or constrictors. It was geared to more all of your animals. Is that correct? Yeah, that was the original one that I started back in June. That was the one I was going to kind of go off of and see what were people interested in. Were they more interested in my bird? Were they more interested in my reptiles? Did they just want to see a conglomeration of it? And it ended up growing really, really fast, which was awesome. And then when I found the reptile community, I knew I wanted to focus on that. But I didn't know how to transition my Instagram because it's, you know, Kelsey's Corner Friends is kind of generalized. So then when all that stuff happened with Instagram, which the quick rundown is they ended up like shadow banning my account and I didn't think it was ever going to come back. So I was like, well, this is my chance to transition. This is my chance to move, move in the direction of reptiles, which is what I really, really want to do and focus on. So I just, you know, started a new one and then they ended up reinstating my other account. So I'm kind of on both. <laughs> So, so actually, so I, I went through and I was looking at some of your stuff on your Kelsey constrictors and, and it caught me up at the top. You have a YouTube link. So I, I went to it and I got to tell you, I was extremely impressed with like your knowledge for number one. Uh, I, I, I saw that you, I'm not a ball Python guy. Matter of fact, I have Willie is out tonight in, in honor of you. Because I, I've noticed that you are really a, a big ball python person. I mean, maybe not, I'm assuming that's, that's a majority of your collection. Uh, but when I was listening to you talk about recessive and dominant and co-dominant, that is just nothing but Greek to me. And then you started talking about <laughs> when co-dominant, I'm not even going to try to explain this, but I, this <laughs> really is a blue-eyed leucistic, super Russo, het clown. Okay. So, it started to make just a little more sense listening to you talk about that. And it was, it was quick. You talked fast, but it wasn't, it was fluent. It wasn't like, it wasn't like you couldn't understand what you were saying, but it made sense, which was like, I actually watched two of them today, which I was totally impressed with your YouTube channel and your, especially your knowledge about ball pythons. So I'm assuming that's where your, your heart lies is with your ball pythons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I've done I've done a lot of research. When I when I get passionate about something, when I find something that I really like, I jump like head first into it. So I've I spent like all my free time for two or three months just researching all the genes. And what I really learned the most from was actually Morph Market. They have the whole listing of everything on there and it's all color coded and it's super simple for me to understand. And you know what's so funny is I've noticed that people who are boa people and people who are ball python people, it's kind of like knitting and crocheting. You're either one or the other. You usually can't do both. And that's definitely how it is with me. People talk about boa morphs and I, that I don't understand any of it. I'm like, like I have a very, very small grasp of it. Like I understand that call is a line of al albino kind of like the different lines of exanthic, but all the different, and there's so little, there's so few, so many fewer morphs of boas. So you'd think it would be easier, but I don't know. It just clicks with me. The ball pythons, it just clicks. Boa morphs seem to be gravitating more towards what ball pythons are doing because you've got these breeders who are, they're, they're combining all these genes now and I don't think we'll ever have the amount of morphs that the ball python has, but I would say in 20 years, there's the, the amount of different types of morphs and what people are able to do with a boa constrictor today and the genes, it's, it's, it, it, it's getting closer to uh, what they're doing with ball pythons. But, yeah. you know, uh, so how did that, what was it like, what was your, your first, you held a ball python was your first, uh, the first snake that you held? Mm -hmm. And then you had a sand boa was your first snake that you owned. Is that correct? No, a ball python was my first snake that I owned. Um, he was actually a rescue from a family that they had to, I don't know, they had medical bills or something. So they were getting rid of a bunch of animals that they had. So I rescued him. 
Uh-huh. And then my second, my second snake was a Samboa, which was also a rescue from a friend of mine who did not know anything about taking care of reptiles. And it had actually escaped out of its cage and it had found its way inside of her printer and that's where it was hiding. <laughs> so I was like, no, 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 no. This snake needs a new home. You give that snake to me. <laughs> That's that that that's awesome. My first experience with a snake was my older sister. It's funny we just talked about this the other ta- the other day too. Uh, she had a she had about a twelve foot reticulated python, and oh did you see that? He yawned. Oh. Uh, so anyways, uh, my older sister had a had about a twelve foot reticulated python. She never handled it. She she kept it in this like hundred gallon aquarium, like. I would never keep a snake in an aquarium. That's just me. But it was yeah. all the sides were exposed on it. I remember it was up, up against the wall on a stand. And every time you'd walk by this thing, it would strike the glass. Every time you'd walk by it. And it scared the living daylights out of me. And, and at the same time, it intrigued me. Mm-hmm. So I think I was probably 15 years old and I ended up with a reticulated python. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember what happened to it, but. My, 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 that was my introduction to uh, owning my first snake, getting into reptiles. And, and really, it wasn't until probably about five years ago where I really started to understand husbandry, where I started to understand the care. I grew up in an era where bigger was better. If you had a big snake, it was more of shock value. We didn't yeah. have the internet. We didn't have the information that's out there today. So at least if it was out there, it wasn't shared. It wasn't as available as it is now. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting how we have, what we have accessible to us today for boa care, for ball python care, for, for herp care in general, as opposed to what we have and, and how well we can, we have the ability now to take care of these animals. Yep. Yeah. I love it. It's, you know, some people will get kind of, I don't know, defensive or judgmental about how we keep our snakes, maybe like in a rack system or something like that. And it's like, you know, they're, they're not, in my opinion, snakes are not like a dog. They don't have these happy, sad, disappointed emotions, or they don't miss you. At least I don't think so. I don't know. I can't read their mind, but that's how I view them. They're just kind of there obviously they have feelings and they can be comfortable or uncomfortable or stressed and stuff like that but they don't have this intelligence of emotion of being happy sad I mean they could be angry obviously but um I don't know it's you just have to I guess do what you know is best to do the best research that you can and keep them how you see fit to keep them you know. Exactly. And, and uh, I personally, uh, I feel the same way. I, I kind of believe that, you know, it, they're not like cats and dogs in the sense that if I call Willie, Willie is not going to come to me. Right. Um, Willie is not going to jump for joy when I open up his bin to come out, you know, chances are. If he, if they did, though. <laughs> <laughs> that would be rad. Um, but chances are, if he did, he'd probably want to bite me because it'd be a feeding response and not a greeting response. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? You know, I get more fulfillment out of handling a snake. And, and I'm sure that you will, you'll understand this when you develop a relationship with a snake. I watched you get bit by your snake. So, <laughs> so you have a snake that you actually had to build a relationship with. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's your pied. I don't know if it was a what type of pied it was. She is either a pastel or a fire pied. Okay. She's actually calmed down quite a bit since she's gotten older and gotten bigger. She's kind of mellowed out a little. I think that it, in that moment, it was just very stressful for, you know, I had just brought her home and then I was like, well, I got to make this video before I, because I didn't want to put her in there and then get her back out and then put her in and get her back out. I just wanted to kind of get it all over with in the beginning put her up, let her acclimate for a week or two, and then be done with it. So, so tell me a little bit about Kelsey's constrictors now, now that you've got your kind of direction, I'm assuming, and, and uh, 
you're focusing on the constrictors, like this is Gary's constrictors. And mm -hmm. it's, I call it that I, I, for, for one is because I do have more than just boa constrictors. And the more that I own the retics, the more I'm really starting to gravitate towards the super dwarf retics. So it's, you know, constrictors being that anything that constricts, whether it be the, yep. the ball python, I had a very large ball python collection. And uh, I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but let's talk about Kelsey's constrictors and, and uh, what your direction is right now with that. So my plan is to focus on ball pythons right now. So um, I would like to learn more about boas. And like I said, it's, I have a hard time with the morph thing, but I do eventually want to kind of transition and maybe do more in that direction and maybe make it like 70, 30, something like that. Um, which is why I picked the name Kelsey's Constrictors. You know, a lot of people will be like, so-and-so's Royal Python, so-and-so's Ball Pythons, whatever. I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to limit myself and then have to change my branding again. So for now, I'm going to be focusing on Ball Pythons. Um, my plan, I have a five-year plan of what I want to do. Um, I'm going to be focusing on Clown, Exanthic, and Pied. And basically, my goal for the next year is to have my first clutches. So I've been pairing two of my snakes, no eggs yet. But my short term goal is to get through my first season, have a couple of clutches. And as I continue to grow over the next year, continue to collect more snakes and just I, I'm in the very foundational beginning right now of my brand and of my business and stuff like that so there's a lot of beginning stuff that I'm really still working on um, and especially learning too you know I, I I'm constantly learning I'm constantly looking stuff up I want to keep everything in my head fresh because I want to be on top of everything and it helps too because I'm making videos that are educational so the more I learn the more I can teach somebody else they're not just educational but they're interesting uh, I mean, that was one of the things that really grasped me about what I watched. I, I watched, probably, I don't remember how many videos I watched, but the ones that really stuck out to me were when you were talking about, um, you were talking about your uh, Exanthic Pied uh, Clown, I think it was, yeah. you wanted to put these three together and what you'd have oh. to do to get just the two, the two genes in one and then have to go back to do the other one. And yep. that is like a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work and and personally myself you know i'm a i'm a collector and a, a hobbyist the, tell us about your your dream snake that you that you i've watched the video so i thought it was really really cool. <laughs> my yeah my dream snake is is an exanthic clown pied so that's three recessive genes so getting three recessive genes visually no one's done it as far as i know no one's done it yet um, they're the exanthic clowns alone are very hard to find and they're very expensive if you do find one. So, you know, like you said, like my other video talking about how you got to breed in and then breed back and then it's, it's going to be a five-year project, but I'm hoping in five to six years to be able to produce those and hopefully hit the odds. Um, and this is kind of a hefty goal. But my goal for myself is to not be working in five years. So I want this to be my full-time thing, 100%. So, so, so you've, you've done a lot of education. You've done a lot of work on this. What, there's, tell us about the, the, uh, the, the semantics of breeding. I mean, it's not just throwing two snakes in a bin and saying, make me some babies. Oh, yeah. it's, there's, there's more to it. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean... Like I said, I've been pairing two of my snakes. I've witnessed two locks for one of them. Um, you have to do it on a schedule. Um, you can't just throw them in there, leave them in there and hope that they'll do their thing. You gotta check on them. You gotta, it's once a month. I pair mine once a month. So on the first day of the month, I put the male in there with the female and I check on them. Usually I'll put them in before work. So I put them in before work. I'll let them go all day. When I get home from work, I check on them. If they're locked, awesome. If not, I'll leave them in there. Max, I'll leave them in there is three days. If they haven't locked in three days, probably not going to. So put him back in his bin, try to feed both of them and try again the next month. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, I've 
So my two locks that I've had is they're, they were both from my inchy to my banana boy. So fingers crossed for female bananas. Um, oh, I remember what I was going to say. So as far as like breeding and my goals and stuff, <clears throat> while I have this very hefty goal of Xanthic Clown Pied, which by the way is going to be an extremely expensive snake, especially if no one's produced one by the time I end up producing them. Um, I also, I want my snakes to be accessible to everybody. So I don't want to be focused. I'm not focused on money. I mean, yeah, money's great. Don't get me wrong, but that's not why I'm in this. I'm in this because I love the animals and I'm in this because other people love the animals. And I think everyone should be able to experience that if they want to. So while I love having this goal of having this very expensive and hard to produce snake, I want to also produce stuff that everybody can buy because not everybody wants a $10,000 steak. Not everybody wants to get into breeding. So, I mean, blue eyed Lucy's are extremely popular because people like how they look. They'll buy one as a pet because they like how they look. And that's what I, you know, so I'm doing the banana, blah, blah, blah. I'm doing the banana and the inchy and that's not going to be a million dollar snake, but it's going to be awesome. And it's going right. to be a cool snake either way. So, the, but there's, but there's all, and there like temperature gradient settings that, that breeders do too. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And, and that's what I was saying that you just don't throw them in a box and, and pray right. and, you know, wake up one day and they've got eggs. Uh, I've, I've watched videos on it and I think maybe that in itself may have cured me from wanting to breed because it just seems like too much work. Um, See, I think it's really easy. I, I think it's as simple as it can be. And that's just... why we need people like you. Because people <laughs> like me, too much work. <laughs> yeah, so you, there's a little bit of preparation that you have to do. Um, obviously, if you're going to start breeding, you want to have your incubator ready before you start doing anything. Because you don't want to have eggs. You don't want to have a snake sitting on eggs and you don't have anything to put them in. So that would be the first step. Um, you got to have a thermostat hooked up to it. You know, there's, there's a lot, I have a video on how to build an incubator too, but there's just so much that goes into just that alone. And that has to be exactly right. You know, between 88 and 90 degrees, the humidity inside their box has to be pretty much a hundred percent. And if anything happens, then all your eggs could go inviable or the snakes could die or they wouldn't develop properly and then they would die. And there's all kinds of things that can go wrong just if that's not right. <clears throat> so once you have that, then you got to think, okay, so like you said, you have to get the temperatures right for the snake itself. So ball pythons and the wild, they breed in the winter time and they go off of barometric pressure. So even though they're indoors and they don't experience the weather and all that, they're in a one temperature all year round, they go off barometric pressure. So they know when it's winter time and all of my snakes are moody. I mean, they get more moody when it comes to time for them to breed. So I do, I lower their temperature in their rack about two degrees, not a lot, just enough to hopefully help stimulate a little. I've read controversial things about that. Some people do, some people don't, doesn't really matter, but I chose right. to. Um, and then once you see some confirmed locks, then you go, okay, now I'm going to be looking for an ovulation. I'm looking for my female to quit eating because she's ovulating. And then they have a prelay shed. Once they have their prelay shed, uh, I think it's 30 days until they actually lay their eggs and then 60 days of incubation at 88 to 90 degrees. You should really do a series. Uh, I, maybe you have, and I haven't seen it, but do a series on start to finish. You know, <laughs> like, like this is the, this is the lock, lock time. They're going to get three days alone. And, and then you check on it. I mean, that, I would totally watch it. I would totally watch it. There's always somebody looking for a way to feed a finicky ball python. Yep. I actually, I just did a video on it on my channel too, talking about reasons why your ball python might not be eating or your snake in general, but I guess for tricks. So for mine, I feed a mix of live or frozen thaw. So I have some snakes that will not eat frozen and I have some that'll eat pretty much anything. Thank God 
not yet. I don't have any snakes that refuse regular rats and I have not had to try to find ASFs. Fingers crossed that I don't have to do that anytime soon because it's that's a totally different topic, totally different ball game altogether. And for um, those people that don't know, ASF is African short for. Yes, yes. So that and that's their normal diet in the wild too. Right. So that's why it's something that typically, if they don't eat anything, they'll typically go for that. If you're having a problem, uh, let me get my train of thought back on track. What was I saying? Uh, Oh, tricks. So some of mine eat live, some of mine eat frozen. Uh, I pretty much transitioned over to live. I hate feeding live. If all of them could be on frozen, I would much prefer that. But there is an advantage to feeding live in that if they don't eat, I can just put it back in the bin. It's not going to go to waste. Um, cause I was having to, when I was feeding frozen, I was having to stagger everything. And you know, if they, I would feed three this day and then four, two days later, and then three, two days later. So it was time consuming and it's just so much easier now feeding live. And I also breed my own rats, which is great. because I save a lot of money. So that's one trick is the African soft fur rats. Um, if you can find those, they're actually legal in a lot of states. So keep that in mind. If you're thinking about buying a ball python, or getting in breeding. So that's one thing. Um, the temperatures have to be right. The humidity has to be right. If your temperature is too high or too low, then they might refuse food because if the temperature is too low, it slows their metabolism down. They're cold, cold blooded animals. So if they don't have enough heat in their body or if they don't have somewhere to go, they can't digest their food because that's literally how they survive. So they'll refuse food if it's too cold for them because they know they can't digest it. So exactly. that's, just, that's a couple of things that you can do. That, that has got to be, I think, one of the most common reasons why is, is, is husbandry. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the temperature, it's the humidity, or maybe it's the snake feels vulnerable, stressed out. It's, yep. the, it's the environment that it's kept in. Those are always the things that I check first. You said something really important though that I wanted to um, come back to is the snake feeling vulnerable could be a reason that they're not eating. So tub size or enclosure size, whatever you're keeping your snake in, that is very, very important. And that can definitely make a difference on whether or not they eat. If you don't have any hides in there, like you said, they're gonna feel very vulnerable. If the, some snakes are just picky, you know, there, there is not necessarily a right or wrong way to do a rack system or tubs. But some snakes, if the tub is too big, then they feel exposed and vulnerable and they won't eat. If the tub's too small, then there's not enough room for them to move around and do what they need to do. And some of them just have these preferences where they're like, I'm going to be picky and this is only what I'm ever going to do and you're going to do what I, you know. So they, they, they definitely can have attitudes too, for sure. But that's, yeah, that's an important one. Um, I had a lady that I bought some rats from they breed rats and they had a bunch of a bunch of snakes. And she was telling me about this baby snake that she had just got a ball python. And she said, it hasn't eaten since I've gotten it. And she's had it for a month or two. She said that the guy that sold it to her told her that it had had a few meals. Well, then after she brought it home, the guy ended up saying, oh, it hasn't ate with me at all. So she's had this snake that was hatched out two months ago that has never eaten. Wow. And I'm like, how is this thing alive, first of all? And she had this bitty, bitty little ball python in a 40 gallon glass terrarium. And the humidity was probably 30%. And so that's what I told her. I'm like, this is way too big. You need, the, you need a small, a small thing, a little bitty thing. It needs to have water, it needs to have a hide. You've got to somehow figure out how to regulate your humidity. I tried to follow up with her and I think she took offense to it, kind of what you were saying earlier. And she said, I've got it, thanks. And I'm like, okay, I'm just trying to help. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to offend you. I just don't want your snake to die, you know? All right. So the, I don't best know we, the best we can do is just educate, you know, and, and, and people will take what they can with it. Um, what do you do for your setups? You have uh, 15 snakes now, you said, or 17? 
15. Yep. So including my boa, I have 14 ball pythons. All of the ball pythons are in a rack system. And then I do have her in a glass terrarium. She's totally fine with it. She loves it. It's a 75 gallon. I She's been in it since I got her, since she was a little baby. So I just went ahead and gave her what she needs. So I don't have to keep spending money and replacing and then selling the old ones. And But she's got a little climbing pole in there. She's got her water dish. She's got a bunch of logs. She's always hiding under the logs. She loves the logs. Well, that's that's great. Boa constrictors, I think they're, they're a different animal. I mean, mm -hmm. in a sense where... I, 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 I hate to sound like I bag on ball pythons because I do. I, 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 I don't mean it in a bad sense. I just not a very good ball python keeper, I guess is what it boils down to. <laughs> but to me, they're just not very inquisitive animals. They're not, they're like pet rocks. I've been criticized for saying that, but Willie is not like that. Willie is like, oh, he did it again. <laughs> Willie is like, he's like a boa constrictor in a ball python suit. So you've got um, a little debacle. I don't know if that's something that you want to talk about. Um, I, I know you had it on Instagram, so that's why I, I pull it up. You mm -hmm. actually uh, had to, to relocate your animals. Yeah. And you were, I, I, I thought you said you were going to have to, they were like going to be two hours away, but somebody stepped up to the plate right around the corner. Yes. Yeah, uh, that was truly a godsend blessing like i'm so 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 thankful for them i thought he was joking when he first told me that i was like wait are you serious i was like i have rats too he's like oh that's fine i love rats so long story short um i live in an apartment complex and i knew when i started collecting these animals that i technically wasn't supposed to have them in there i've been living here for a year and a half and i've never had an issue and I mean, really, snakes are a landlord's dream pet. Come on, they're quiet, they don't stink, they're not destructive, they sit there and they do nothing. But regardless, I signed a lease, so I knew I was taking a risk. Well, a couple of months ago, I think in September, they got new management down at the office and they were bought out by another company. So I guess they're way more strict now and yada, yada, yada. They came into my apartment and saw everything and sent, left me a letter on my door. And then I took the letter down there. I didn't want to show my hand because I didn't know what they thought I had or knew I had, like maybe they just saw the rats. So then I could just deal with the rats and the snakes will be fine. Well, she knew about everything. And then she was like, what's in those drawers? And I'm like, why don't you open one and find out? <laughs> I didn't really say that, but I wanted to. Um, so they, they ended up knowing about everything. They gave me seven days to figure out what to do. Um, I do have a friend in Gainesville that told me he could keep them. And then I was telling a group of my friends about the situation I was going through. And then that's when my other friends stepped up and said, oh, we've got an extra bedroom. We've got a shed out back. You can keep the rats in there. You can keep the snakes in the house. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is literally the best thing ever. Like, thank you so much. So it's, and they literally live five minutes away. I could not have asked for a better solution. It's great. Being that you live in a region where 90% of most snakes bought from Morph Market are shipped from Florida. Is that correct? You live in Florida, right? Yes. I mean, you're, you guys are subject to hurricanes. You're subject to massive destructive weather. People's facilities get destroyed and snakes go everywhere. Does it become difficult to find a place to like raise snakes? I'm not even talking about breeding snakes. I'm, I'm talking about somebody who wants just to own a snake. I can, I can see because here in California, I mean, we, I'm way off the coast. So we don't, we have absolutely no laws regarding amounts of animals we can own or size of animals we can own, at least not as of yet we don't. But I know that there's a lot of um, areas that do. And I know that, you know, with Florida and hurricanes, the, the Burmese python being the invasive uh, species in the, in, the, um, in the swamps and everything, does that pose a threat to the hobbyist in just in general in Florida? <clears throat> yeah, I would say it does. Um, they actually just passed a law April of last year 
uh, no more iguanas, no more tegus. There's a couple of other snakes now. I mean, you can still have them, but you have to have a permit now. You can't just buy them in the store. You have to have a class three permit. I think that's what it's called to own those certain animals. And there's some snakes that are included in there as well. Um, really frustrated a lot of people. It's, it caused like a lot of outrage. Now, if you already had these animals before they put the law in, then you're fine, but now you can no longer obtain them. And there is actually also a law, um, I'm not gonna go into detail about it because I actually don't know, but there is a law for certain people. If I don't know if it's if you're a business or if you have some of those animals in that classification that you have to have a permit for, you have to have a hurricane prepared facility that they're in because the, like you said, the Burmese Python problem that we have in Florida, especially in the Everglades, you know, people think, oh, it's because people got this snake and it got, they didn't realize it was going to get so big. So they just let it go. Mm, that could be a small percentage, but a huge percentage of the problem is because of exactly that. There was a hurricane that came through, everything got destroyed. These snakes got out and that's it. They breed like crazy. They're out in the wild now. Now you've got 100,000 20 foot Burmese pythons causing a problem eating people's dogs and you know it's scary right we we have the same problem here where people buy a snake and they don't realize it's going to get 10 feet long and next thing you know they find it behind a walmart you know at, at 11 o'clock at night uh most captive bred animals will come out and they're usually don't pose a threat they usually pose a like a shock and awe kind of thing like oh my god and next thing you know you got animal control and police and and then of course you got people with social media calling people like me saying, Hey Gary, there's a, there's a big snake down here. Maybe you should come help them catch it, you know? But, uh, I think that's, that's, that's just a, it, that's just an irresponsible keeper in general. And that can be in any state. So us arc, are you involved? Do you, do you, are you a member of us arc? Not yet. I do plan on contributing to that at some point. Um, right now I'm, still trying to figure out my finances. I had some stuff happen last year that kind of I'm trying to bounce back from. And, you know, I've had some snakes die as well, unfortunately. So it's trying to move money around to figure out, but I've looked into it. I definitely want to do it. They do great work. They do auctions. They, they, you know, that law that I was telling you about that they passed last year, that's the kind of stuff that they focus on. So they want to help people stay in the hobby because at the end of the day, this is really a conservation project too. You know, there's people out there that hate zoos. They're like, these animals are wild animals and they shouldn't be, but you got to understand that a zoo or someone who's breeding snakes, like at the end of the day, this is a conservation project too. Yes, they're wild animals. Ideally, yes, we're not going to get involved and they're going to live their lives peacefully in the wild, but that's not the reality of the world we live in. There's deforestation that goes on. There's uh, colonization, new cities being built, the, these suburban areas just flattening out all of these animals land all over the world, not just here. So, you know, it's, it's important to be able to keep animals that way as well and be able to educate people about it because there's, there could come a time where they're not around anymore. And especially right. with ball pythons, it's such a, a gift, I think, for us to be able to find all of these morphs and breed them into these beautiful creatures that you could never find in the wild. And all of them came from the normal morph. Yes, yes. I often think about that. When you think about the normal morph and what we as a society or as, as keepers are doing to these animals, the chances of that ever happening in our lifetimes. Could you imagine if a, a, so, so a normal and normal end up having some sort of a gene and they have an offspring that goes out and finds another normal, then creates offspring. And then, I mean, it just becomes, it would take a thousand years to get yeah. your, your clown and Xanthic pied, you know? Yeah. Uh, but anyways, going back, circling back to our uh, US art, U.S. Arc, uh, I, I'm a member, and, and what I really like about U.S. Arc is they're there for us. They fight for our rights. They yeah. actually, um, they, they, they educate us on, on bans, on laws, on things that are happening in the reptile industry, and they decipher it for us 
because some of these laws that are trying to be written are, are being written by like what you're saying, uh, conservation groups, and they're, they're, they're intending it to sound one way, but they're including a bunch of animals that, that include our animals, snakes, lizards, uh, monitors, yeah. and things like that. So today is your lucky day because we're going to play a game called Fact or Fiction. Ooh. And it's five questions that I'm going to ask you. Okay. And you're going to say fact or fiction. For every correct answer that you get, I will donate $5 to US Art in your name. Awesome. So I have to go to my phone because obviously I'm not the smartest cat on the block and uh, <laughs> I forget. So let's see here. Your first question, fact or fiction? Some cultural regions in Asia believe that the ball python is sacred, performing ceremonies for any snake that was killed by mistake. Fact or fiction? Fiction. Bingo, there you go. So that's actually in Africa, not Asia, but it is a true statement that in Africa, they believe that the ball python is a very uh, sacred animal. So, all right, question number two. The ball python is listed as near extinction on the ICUN red list. Fact or fiction? Fiction. Ding, you are correct. They are near threatened, not near extinction. All right, so that's $10 for you going to US ARC so far. Number three, the number one threat to the ball python is habitat loss, fact or fiction? Uh, I'm gonna go with fact on that. That is wrong. Poaching, uh, poaching really? is the number one threat to the ball python. Hmm. All right, this one you're gonna get with no problem. I, I did these before I watched your, uh, your video. The pied gene is a recessive trait, fact or fiction? That's uh, $15 going to U.S. ARC. And your final question. There are currently over 4,000 different ball python morphs. Fact or fiction? <laughs> uh, if we're talking, okay, I'm going to say fiction. 4,000 ball python morphs. That's a lot. I'm going to say fiction. All right, so that is correct. Anybody who wants to challenge me, they were pulled off Wikipedia. Wikipedia and the internet are always correct, at least for <laughs> yeah. my purposes. So you get $15 donated to US Art. I will put that in your name. And uh, is there anything else? Would you have anything else to, that you would like to convey to the reptile keepers, the reptile industry? If you have one thing that you could share uh, for this hobby, what would it be? Ooh, that is a tough one. One thing to share. Um, I need more preparation for that one. Give it a chance. If you're scared of snakes or if you're thinking about getting into it or you're interested in it, find a way to give it a chance because it's one of the most awesome things in the whole world in my opinion learn about it even if even if you don't want one as a pet you know it's a growing industry and the beautiful thing about it is is we have so much information now at our fingertips mm. we, have, we can do so much research before we purchase an animal to to know that uh if we are doing the right thing or not you know what? I really want to thank you for your time tonight. It was a lot of fun getting to know a little bit more about Kelsey. And, uh, you know, thanks again. Well, I really appreciate you having me on. This has been really fun. Awesome. So check this out. We will air this in uh, February. We'll put this on February. I believe it's February 4th. So I want to thank you guys for tuning in, watching the channel. I want to thank everybody that likes and subscribes to this channel. And if you get the opportunity, go to Kelsey Constrictors, subscribe to her channel, watch her videos. I mean, there is some super, super cool information. I was not expecting to see and hear what I was hearing when I was listening to these videos. So 
And if you've got any ball python questions about traits, go over to Kelsey Constrictors. Really easy to listen to information. I dig it. You should too. Thanks for watching.